So, I'm going to talk about Will Wheaton at the end of this episode. I figure we'll talk about the episode first. Normally I like to approach the behind the stuff scene, the behind the scenes stuff first. But I kind of want to save this towards the end because it's going to be kind of heavy and unpleasant to talk about. <clears throat> so, um, this was an episode that Jerry Taylor worked on extensively. You can kind of tell. Several of the scenes between Crusher, that is to say Wesley, and Picard, good stuff. Both actors clearly work very well together. Funnily enough, this is not the first time I've said this about two, the two actors. Uh, as I've said many times, the scenes between the two of them over in... Um, oh my god, I can't think of the name of it. The Samaritan Snare. There we go. The Samaritan Snare were the only things that salvaged that episode from Lamentation Territory. And frankly, they were actually kind of awesome, regardless of the fact that they were better than the rest of the track of that episode. In fact, they even reference those events in this episode. That continuity thing, like I mentioned earlier. Anyways. <clears throat> so this was intended to be Wesley's goodbye. The, the farewell from Will Wheaton from the show. He would actually come back later. He came back in the game. The first duty parallels Journey's End and <laughs> an unfortunately brief cameo when it came to Nemesis. And that's it. That was the, the full extent of Wesley Crusher throughout the rest of Star Trek. For someone who had been a regular cast feature for a significant amount of time and had several episodes to de dedicated to him, this was his swan song. And while, again, he will show up after this, and I actually particularly like the first duty, and there's decent parts about some of the other episodes I just mentioned, I really feel like this is the goodbye episode right here. Now, that being stated, <laughs> well... Uh, I also say that because I think this is a better goodbye than Journey's End, but we'll get there when we get there. I also mention that because apparently a lot of the cast really got along well with Wheaton. In fact, there's actually this wonderful bit that I found. I'm not going to read the whole thing to you here, but if you go look it up, you can find a copy of a letter that Patrick Stewart had sent in to, to the offices. Uh, this is actually back during the Season 2, Season 3 uh, issue, where I mentioned how Stewart was unhappy with his role and was wanting it to be changed. And in that letter, he met, he just has a little aside where he mentions how he really wants to have more interactions with Wesley because he felt that every time he worked with Will Wheaton was a delight. That's his words there. And I just point that out because, again, it's clear that the actors were kind of sad to see him go, and there's some genuine and legitimate camaraderie there. We'll talk more about the specifics of that in a minute. Anyways, so he's going off to the Academy. They found a slot for him. He's going to have to work hard to make up for the year. I mean, you know, considering he already had a slot, and they could have just gotten... You know what? I'm not even going to dissect that. The way the Starfleet Academy run is bonkers and stupid. So let's just admit that and move on. <laughs> um... So this teaser actually lasts a full 4 minutes and 55 seconds, which is kind of crazy in its own right. But what I find doubly strange is the nature of the circumstance. So the, he's taking them down, and they're going to do this mining dispute, and blah, blah, blah. And the ship breaks down within, in spatial terms, within inches of a, its actual destination, so close that even with a breaking down ship, they were able to get it to a nearby planetoid. I don't know if you understand how insane that is, because as usual, fiction doesn't seem to understand how large space is. But for a ship to just kind of spiral out of control and then manage to crash it on a nearby moon, even though that's not a particularly habitable moon, is actually kind of crazy in its own right. Uh, I don't actually have much else to add to that other than the fact that they're very lucky. Notice they're actually in visual range of multiple moons and a planet when this is actually happening, which is also pretty impressive. Now... Before we talk about the rest of the desert scenes, I want to switch modes over here and talk about the barge scenes. Because they're bad. I'm sorry. <laughs> it is extremely clear that the barge scenes, which there's only actually like three or four scenes dedicated to the barge thing. The only reason the barge scenes happen, let's just be 100% honest about this, is so that the Enterprise can't rescue them too quickly so they could have the dilemma down on the planet. That's the only reason. There are other ways they could have done that. But they didn't. So here we have the barge scenes, and they're filler at best. Now, before I come across as too harsh, Jerry Taylor herself, who, as I mentioned, did a lot of work in this episode, flat out admits that that kind of sci-fi-y stuff was just not her thing. And she herself has admitted that she hated working on the barge stuff and just couldn't make it work. And, you know, not every writer can write everything, so that's perfectly understandable. You'd think they would have brought someone else in to try and smooth out the, the holes, because the problem is everything about the radiation scowl makes no real sense. So it's a radiation barge that someone tossed out into space. Now, that's the one and only thing that makes sense. 
we in real life have actually considered the possibility of dumping all our garbage into a spaceship, giving it a rocket, and just hitting go. Boom! It's gone, right? Not our problem. So that's at least believable. I like to think that the, this is actually an old ancient Malon ship that they sent off like thousands of years ago. Oh, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Although I have to admit, it's hard to watch this episode and not think of the Malon. Anyway, so they get to this barge, and the first dilemma they have is that they can't get too close to the barge, and they're having trouble moving it. Now, both of these problems make a degree of sense, but the problem is whoever was writing this clearly doesn't understand physics. I'm sorry to say that so crudely, but one of the most obvious solutions to this problem is to get behind it and push tractor beam the ship and you know the barge and push it until they're going at a certain rate. Once they're going at that rate, the tractor beam could be turned off. It's going to keep going. That's how momentum works. In fact, this is actually what they end up doing once they get past the asteroid belt. Logical. But according to people who are smarter than me, yeah, I actually did my research on this one, uh, it would actually be entirely possible to get them up to that rate by very gradual acceleration and then let go and then gradually accelerate and let go and then gradually accelerate and let go until it gets to the point where they're effectively pushing this thing much, much faster in order to bypass the whole time problem and the whole, we're, we're ruining the tractor beams to get this going problem. Whatever. <clears throat> the next problem is there's an asteroid belt in the way. Now, that's stupid on many levels. I myself actually once wrote a story where there was a debris belt that was preventing ingress into er earlier into the system. And just about everyone involved was like, you know, this doesn't even make sense because this would basically have to be a sphere over the entirety of the sun to really block ingress, right? But instead, it was being presented as a singular object. Turns out there was more going on. That was the whole point. It was a deliberate inconsistency because someone was masquerading. You don't need to hold the specifics. The point is... Asteroid belts are not a sphere defending a star. In fact, if you think about it, even if you consider the full height of what an asteroid field could be, it would probably take them, oh, I don't know, a couple minutes to go over it. Because, I know this is going to sound strange, but space is actually in full three dimensions. So, again, to go with an extremely simple and easy answer, they could have just towed the barge up, or down, sufficiently enough to go over the lip, as it were, of the asteroid belt, push it in a specific direction, because I'd like to think that the Enterprise crew, especially with data on board, has the ability to math out the exact trajectory they would need to send this thing to launch it into the sun, since we can do that now, and do so. And then off they go to save them. The next point, this is good stuff. And again, we see Jerry Taylor kind of showing off her more proper chops here. There's this wonderful scene where Troy walks in and updates Crusher, Beverly Crusher, on the news about the search party with regards to finding her son. Praise to both actresses and praise to the writing, because this one scene actually in many ways helps actually add to the episode. Crusher is clearly distraught to the point where she can't properly function, so instead she doesn't. She just gets lost in her work. And you could tell that she, and, and there's a bit where, you know, we're not sure we can find him. Okay, is basically the reaction to that. With that sort of, this is fine kind of a thing going, right? It's a very well done scene, and praise to that. And I already mentioned, so uh, here's another one. Someone actually also mentioned this idea. Why not just toss it at the asteroid belt and walk away? Yes, this will then break up the ship, and there will be asteroid doom uh, radiation in the asteroid field, but how much does that actually matter? Then, of course, there's the final um, and most obvious way of dealing with this. Drag it, tow it in a direction away from the planet, mark where it went, or even leave a tracker on it if you want to be fancy, and then go leave and fix the situation with Wesley and Picard. Once you find them and rescue them, go back and either have enough sufficient capacity to math to figure out where the, exactly the barge is, or follow the tracking beacon you put on it, and then deal with the barge. Everyone treats the barge as if it's some super emergent death, we need to deal with this right now kind of situation, but nothing about the actual episode makes that work. It is, in short, filler. It is there to make sure they don't rescue the primary plot too early. And, frankly, it's weak and it's dumb. Moving on. Let's get to the good stuff. Because I do like this episode, believe it or not. I actually, it's funny. If for the longest time I've thought about this episode and been irritated by two elements. I've already just told you one, which is the barge. But the other element we'll, we'll get to in a second. But for the most part, I still remember this episode as a definitive positive experience. Net positive, as I like to say. Um, so... The shuttle crashes, 
They do some actual location shoots, which look great. And the replicator's damaged. Okay. That's bad. Well, we can deal with that. Just get your emergency rations out. Oh, I don't have any. And there's this wonderful bit where Picard, in almost astonishment, says, you don't have any emergency supplies? I hate to point this out, but you'd think Geordi's safety inspection early in the episode would have caught that, but let's just move on from that. Now, what I love is Patrick Stewart manages to add just a perfect amount of total despair and dread into his voice when he says, You're saying there's no water? Water is one of those really strange resources for human beings because it's such an everyday normal thing. I have literally two full cups, two, like, 44-ounce cups here. It's, it's these things. I've, ooh, the top's coming off. It's these things right here. And, you know, I, I drink from this regularly because I talk for a living. But it's such a normal, everyday aspect of life, it's funny to think of how absolutely critical it is. It's like air. It's such a normal thing, right? But it's funny in its own right. Almost every bit of survival training I myself have gone through in real life is primarily focused on temperature and water. Those are the two biggest things. Food is something your body can deal without for a fairly significant amount of time if you know what you're doing. And sleep is something that, well, you're basically going to fall unconscious at a certain point. Anyway, so you just want to make sure you're under the right circumstances. But you need to be the right temperature. Too hot or too cold is bad. And you need water. And it's very interesting to think about that. They do a good job of portraying Picard as someone who has what should be Starfleet training. Wesley, too, actually. Both of them do a good showing of people who have had the kind of training necessary to survive in such extreme circumstances. The kind of thing that, to be 100% blunt, should be standard procedure for all Starfleet personnel. And whether or not it is depends on the specific episode in question. This is the same Starfleet where someone didn't know what a splint was. But this is also the same Starfleet, especially over on Deep Space Nine, where they will be in dire circumstances many times and be able to survive with basically nothing many times, as it should be. Again, this kind of survival training should be normal. I wouldn't be surprised if they have to repeat, uh, do kind of a form of continuing education with survival training every now and again, just to make sure. But I digress. The next thing I want to talk about is that Picard is actually astonishingly diplomatic to the pilot. Um, you know, do you have any other ideas? Is there anything else I'm missing? I do value your input. Basically, the whole episode, Picard handles the pilot, whose name I didn't bother writing down, because <laughs> he just wasn't actually that big of a role. Durgo, that's his name, Durgo. Um, he handles the pilot quite well overall. Really, he does. Uh, Durgo, I should use his name. Because he never actually pushes him down, but he never lets, gives him an inch either. It's, it's, a, it's a nice balancing point and helps to showcase Picard's diplomatic skills. By contrast, Wesley basically can't deal with Durgo, and it effectively leads to Durgo's death. It's a nice contrast, and for once, for once, the death of a, of a guest star, you know, the death of what is effectively a red shirt, actually does help to show how serious the situation is. Partially because of the way it's executed partially because of the way that they set him up, and partially because of the fact that it's very, it's very well made clear that if Picard was still active and functioning, this wouldn't have happened and he wouldn't have died. I think this is probably one of the better examples of the red shirt death to prove the situation of seriousnesses across Star Trek. And I've spoken many times about how much I dislike the red shirt concept in general, so I think I've made my point there moving on. So there's this interesting point where we see the guy drink from what looks like a water canteen, and then he goes back into the desert. Now, the intent is obviously for us, the audience, to think that he is, he is hiding water. What I find most interesting is that when he's called on it, he says, Oh, no, it's not water. I wouldn't hide that. Now, the way he says that, maybe I'm a weirdo, but I actually firmly believe him on that. I really do. I think that Durgo is a bit of a dick, but mostly he's not a horrible human being. And that he's the kind of person who, if he had real water, would probably share it. I really do think he would. As much as he's shown to be antagonistic, especially towards Wesley, which is, let's be honest, this is a Wesley episode, I, I can't buy him going that far. It is, of course, worth noting that it isn't water. It's basically alcohol, which is predominantly being used for medicinal purposes. But it's also alcohol, glug, glug. I also like Picard's reaction to that. This is going to make you drier, not wetter. And he's like, yeah, I'll take my, tra my chances. And Picard's like, no, no, we're going we're to keep this for, for medicinal use just in case. Now... I want to give special praise once again to Ron Jones. <laughs> uh, Ron Jones is, all, is not quite out of the series yet. Rick Berman hasn't fired him for being too excellent at his job yet. However, 
it's all I've said this before. You can always tell Jones. He has a he has a unique cadence and style to his music. And the music that kicked up when they were traversing the desert off in direction of the mountains was great. It very adequately got across the impact and emotion of the scene. And basically all the music across all the episode does that. But I wanted to give special praise to that piece as they're traversing the desert. It was really good stuff. Anyways. So some stuff happens. I want to skip over some things because I want to talk about my complaints last. I want to talk about the good stuff first because I love the character moments between Picard and Wesley. I think I already praised that, but I think it deserves extra praise. Wesley comes across as someone who is scared and courageous. In other words, that he is afraid, but he's not letting himself be defeated by that fear, that he is still taking action even though he's afraid. It's good stuff, and it helps to showcase an aspect of his character, that bravery, and his ability to basically keep going because he has had such an excellent uh, tutor in the form of Picard. And once again, we see how Picard has grown very fond of Wesley, and vice versa, how Wesley looks up to him and wants him to be proud of him, and in Picard's own admission, I have always been proud of you, Wesley. Well, there have definitely been some bad Wesley moments in TNG, and I've pointed them out as we've gone through this. I think basically by the time season two rolled around, those moments pretty much went away, except for a few tiny little nidbit details here and there. As I mentioned before, I was never one of the Wesley haters, and seeing scenes like this really helps to flesh out the character underneath what was usually used as an archetype of Wesley Crusher. I also absolutely love... I love his line to him, I, how I envy you. How, uh, you are just at the beginning of your journey. And there is so much genuine sincerity in those words. But I have to be honest, I kind of think it was Patrick Stewart talking to Will Wheaton. As I mentioned before, Stewart was actually quite fond of Wheaton and enjoyed working with him. And there's a bit towards the end of the episode where you know Picard says, Wesley, you will be missed, and reaches out a hand. And Wesley just holds his hand as they're walking off the camera. I think there was a little bit of legitimate actor-to-actor -actor in there, not just character-to-character. Just my take on it. He also mentions Boothby. Tells him, you need to find Boothby. He's, he's the groundskeeper. That's a nice little touch, and I do like that. And we will end up seeing uh, Boothby several times in the future. <sighs> Believe it or not, as, as much as this is a fairly good episode, I don't have too much else to say except for two big points. One is in character and one's out. The in character is the fountain. What the hell is up with this fountain? There's some random gushing water fountain in the middle of a mountain range in the middle of a barely survivable desert. This fountain not only has a barrier o doom protecting it from anybody actually reaching it, but also has basically a homing energy thing that bounces out and attacks anything that threatens the shield. Now, both of these point to the same concept, that something is, is deliberately designed this, artificially, most likely, in order to defend this valuable resource, the water. Now, the, the only logical explanation I have ever heard is that this was set up some time ago by whoever actually used to live here in order to defend their, their territory, and then for whatever reason they died or left, take a pick, and just didn't turn off the defense thing. There's a lot of holes with that, but that's probably the closest thing to an explanation that I've ever heard personally. I'm curious if you guys have any thoughts on what the hell is up with this fountain. But if I could be so bold, it reminds me of a lot of Dungeons and Dragons, or pen and paper in general. Hear me out. One of the things I've noticed is that too many dungeons in, you know, Dungeons and Dragons in particular, but pen and paper in general, tend to be very video gamey. Now that's not necessarily a complaint, not really. But too often I find myself thinking, well, why does that work that way? Who exactly enchanted each individual brick so that they could all move over here and design this wall that you'd have to go do this puzzle to get around? You know, it's it actually, most often I hear people make fun of this more in Tomb Raider. Because if you think about it, like, who the hell sat down in, in, in the setting of Tomb Raider? And I was like, okay, so I'm going to make this puzzle so that if you step on these three symbols, which happen to line up with this thing, they'll send a pulley thing, which will somehow make something on the other side of the room... We, n never mind how this connects, but somehow these mechanisms will connect and it'll raise the eye, which will allow the light to beam down. And you know, It's puzzle design. I get that. And that is basically what this is. This is a PNP puzzle. I get that. But one of the things I like to do, especially when designing my own stuff, is to come up with the reason, uh, to come up with the word why. Why does this work? Why is this here? How is it functioning? 
And you don't always have to show that on camera, but I do firmly believe in the concept of doing the under the hood work in order that you, the author, know. Now, unfortunately, I wasn't able to find any information on that, so I have no idea if the authors of this, which was not just Jerry Taylor, it was several other people involved as well, actually did any work on designing this fountain. But all I think of this fountain is, wow, this is convenient. Because let's be honest, the most likely explanation for this fountain is very simple. It was a fountain that required someone to outthink it, to, to be puzzled through. We actually see this because the attempt to brute force it fails miserably twice. Just shooting it doesn't work, and trying to overshoot it between the, the one gun and the other guy, uh, what was his name again? Durgo, also shooting it. That also didn't work. However, when he outthinks it, he even gives his explanation to Picard, you know, I'm going to try this whole thing, and I think I could use it against itself. That is a form of cunning, a form of intellect, solving the puzzle. And, of course, that is the perfect dilemma for Wesley Crusher to fight, right? So that makes perfect sense. I just wish we knew what the hell was up with this thing. Like, if you actually told me that this was an Academy test, I'd be like, yeah, okay. That would actually make perfect sense. Picard was, was, was like faking the whole time. Or maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was supposed to be an Academy test and something goes wrong and Picard legitimately gets injured and, you know, everything goes to hell. You know, that, that would actually make more sense too. But I digress. <sighs> For those of you who don't like... Say, I'm not going to bring down the controversial box because I don't feel like it. And this isn't really controversial. But I just want to give kind of a warning because we're going to get into some stuff that's gray here. And stuff we don't have exact details of. And I hate to do that, but I kind of have to because it's my job. Now, I know some people really like Will Wheaton, and I know some people really hate him. And I have seen a lot of both, especially in the last several years. And I specifically mention that because a lot of people tend to hate or love Will Wheaton, not because of the man or because of the work he's done or because of whether he's a nice person or anything, but because of his political views and no other purpose. Now, if you are one of those people, you are, of course, entirely entitled to your opinion. However, I will ask, please, do not bring politics into this discussion. I don't think it has any place here. Okay? Now, having said that, regardless of the man's political views, I actually have a decent amount of respect for Will Wheaton. And I have actually met the guy once at a Gen Con. Got to ask him a question about story design when it comes to Dungeons & Dragons. It was a fun thing. I've shown it on my channel for anybody who's probably heard of this. And, uh... I have to talk about why Will Wheaton left TNG now. Now, you might wonder why I'm so hesitant about this. I've actually already explained this before, but for those of you who've never heard me talk about this, there's sort of an unspoken of rule when it comes to Hollywood, in that you don't talk. It's one of the reasons why I had such a difficult time understanding exactly why... Oh my god, I can't think of her name. The woman who plays Ivanova over on Babylon 5 actually left Babylon 5... And I, I mentioned how there's conflicting stories and how there's differing accounts and how most of that didn't even come out until years later. I've mentioned how there's several examples, uh, especially amongst actors, where you just it's just kind of that unspoken rule. You just don't talk about it. And even to this day, there is still not 100% certainty about some of the departures of actors when it comes to these shows. I've mentioned that with regards to Jennifer Lyne, or Lean. I've mentioned that with regards to what was going on with Garrett Wong over in Voyager. I've already mentioned it with regards to Denise Crosby, and now I have to talk about it with regards to Will Wheaton. <sighs> Having looked at all of the aggregate of information we have access to, which I hesitate to call facts because all of this is just people talking, so this is all interviews, but having looked at all these interviews, and I jotted down a few specifics, I think we can pretty firmly say that this is Rick Berman's fault. Now, Wheaton himself has said multiple times, adamantly, that it was specifically Rick Berman screwing over his career that made him leave. I, the only reason I say we got to keep talking about that, it's not like I disbelieve Will Wheaton, quite the contrary. Uh, I actually firmly believe him on this one, because Rick Berman has a repeated history of screwing over actors and not being a, a good person to be around. Like, if you ask Deep, Deep Space Nine actors, did not like Berman... Uh, Ira Stephen Bear himself has said that he really, if he had known some of the stuff that was going on, he would have put a stop to it immediately. Avery Brooks once had a, an actual row with Rick Berman that Major Barrett had to get involved in, and on Brooks's side, I might add. Um, the Terry Farrell thing, we'll be talking about that much later. That's like season six of DS9, so that'll come up much later. You know, there's just issue after issue after issue. Marina Sirtis has actually talked about this several times as well. 
Um, in fact, I jotted down some specifics just in case you doubt me. If you want to look up Marina Sirtis on this one, uh, at the Kansas City Convention in 2014 and the Emerald City Convention in 2015, she speaks about this exact same issue. And Will Wheaton himself talks about this during the uh, mission log, which is a, a vlog interview series, uh, specifically episode 22, the one with Will Wheaton, for anybody who wants to, to check up on any of these specifics that I'm referring to here. But again, all this is interviews. But the thing is, there is a, a long-standing repeating pattern of people thinking of Rick Berman as a scumbag. Now, I myself have spoken ill of Rick Berman, but usually that's all on the creative side, the things he was doing that I didn't agree with when it came to the construction of the show. I have to admit, until I really started digging into Star Trek, which I didn't really start doing until I started doing these ruminations, I didn't realize how much more of a scumbag he was. And the problem is, everyone agrees that he was a scumbag. Like, specifics? We don't know exact facts, and they don't always speak of exact, you know, events and whatnot. And yet, every single interview by every single actor all paints the same picture of this person. That he is the archetypal example of the 90s movie executive. You know what I mean? Like, you, you notice that. Back in the 90s, there was this whole thing where, like, the corporate guy was usually the villain in films. That's Rick Berman. Now, I'm not saying he was pure evil, uh, he was probably pretty stupid. And as I've tried to point out before, Rick Berman did do some legitimately good things to help Star Trek, and he deserves credit for that. This is a man who was basically the money person who was in favor of Star Trek, which was kind of unusual at the time. You know, he was one of the money people. He was an executive, and he was more on the executive paramount side of things than he was the Star Trek side of things. Now, then he shifted over to the Star Trek side of things and basically took over the show after Roddenberry was formally out and became the new... Uh, I'm not sure what to call him, because he wasn't really a mainliner. He was more like the guy who was in charge of everything, but not in a creative, supportive kind of way. It's hard to explain. Anyways. So anyways, getting to the specifics of this exact incident with Will Wheaton. Will Wheaton was trying to get involved in another movie at the time. That movie was called Valmon, which I'm probably pronouncing wrong. Uh, it was going to include Colin Firth and Annette Benning. Uh, which included several... Uh, it, 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 okay. So in order to talk about this, i got to segue for just a second. For those of you not aware, there's a thing in Hollywood where your resume kind of matters more than the success of the film. I know that sounds like a weird thing, but many, 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 many times in history, actors will deliberately take underpaying or not particularly interesting jobs just for the ability to be in such and such movie, which may or may not be a good movie, but it's got such and such actor in it. Make sense? It's a career booster. It's something to get them noticed. And this is how a lot of stars actually got their careers onto the, under the radar of, and, and ended up moving their careers forward. And Will Wheaton was wanting to be in this film for that exact purpose. Um, Rick Berman went to Wheaton, and this was not the first time that Rick Berman was a dick to Wheaton. Let's just go and be honest about that. Uh, but, Will Wheaton, sorry, I'm just remembering the William Shatner story. Um, some of you know what I'm talking about. Will Wheaton was like, you know, I, I need to go, I'm going to have to actually go to France to be in this, blah, blah, blah. Now, it's worth noting, Wheaton wasn't saying, I want out of Star Trek. He just wanted to go do this movie to push his career forward. Rick Berman said, no, you don't understand. You're absolutely critical to this episode. Not this one, by the way. It was a previous episode in season four. You're absolutely critical to this episode. We need you here for this episode. And Wheaton's like, okay, fine. So Wheaton agrees to do this. Uh, again, you can hear Wheaton give this tale of himself, so I'm not going to go over all the specifics. The point, the long and the short of it is Rick Berman was lying, that he was basically just trying to do this to ensure that Will Wheaton did not go do this big film thing, which would increase his star power, which is sort of a vague term when it comes to stars, which basically meant that Will Wheaton would then be able to legally and formally request more money to continue being Wesley Crusher. Berman didn't want to allow him to do that because he didn't want to pay the more money. It, it was a typical executive move. You see what I mean when I say this? It's not like he was some malicious, malevolent entity. He was just approaching this like any other sleazy businessman would. And so, Wheaton didn't do the movie, and that led to some issues with Wheaton's career. And Wheaton, this again, this was the basically not the first time this happened. This is the final straw on the back. So Wheaton's like, all right, I want out. And, you know, the staff was like, okay, sure. And they put together Final Mission in order to allow Wheaton to bow out of the show. How much of that is 100% true is, of course, debatable. 
I, I cannot speak for the veracity of events I did not witness when all I have is interviews to go by. It's, it's one of the unfortunate natures of trying to dissect the how and the why when it comes to real-life fiction and the crafting thereof. Because we have to go by interviews as, as our predominant form of information. And uh, those aren't always accurate, as anything anyone who's ever tried to look into Star Wars history knows about. Personally, I fully believe it. It is fully in character for Berman to do and it is fully logical for Wheaton to have tried to do this and then to bow out, to be like, I want to go move my career somewhere, and I'm sick of you pushing me down. I'm out. All of that is fully logical to me. I don't know if that was a good or a bad thing. Unlike the Denise Crosby thing, where I could say with reasonable certainty that she might have gotten more interesting roles in the future, I'm not sure if we would have gotten that with Wesley. And he was in, uh, let's see, one, two, three... Four more episodes after this point, so it's not like he got no screen time whatsoever. As ever, I would like to hear your guys' thoughts, divorced from politics, of course. And uh, I guess that's actually all I got. Overall, a good episode, despite the baggage associated. Hope you guys have enjoyed. I'll see you next time.